Now the policeman said to me, does your dog you know, normally do this? I said, never. And then all of a sudden, the penny dropped. It's dusk, the dog's barking like this. He's trying to warn us all, it's coming. Seeing is believing, and I have no proof of what I saw that day other than what I can describe. It was huge. It was like the weightlifter of cats. Welcome to Big Cat Conversations. We speak directly to people who've encountered one of Britain's big cats. We also discuss the bigger picture. I'm Rick Minter, and thanks for joining me. Hello, welcome to Big Cat Conversations. This is episode 39, being released in early December 2020. Really hope everyone's faring okay in what's been a trying year for us all with COVID impacts. But it's certainly been a frenzy of a year of Big Cat reports in the media. There will be lots more coming your way on the podcast next year. It will start with an episode from Hertfordshire. And for some reason, after vaccinations, when we can get out more, I quite fancy a visit to Halifax in search of a mystery cat that's turned up there recently. So maybe we'll have a podcast special from Halifax's Peace Hall. And if anyone can fix dodgy CCTV equipment, you're especially welcome. Now, for this episode, we promise the nighttime drama of the railway line inspector's encounter in the Peak District. Alas, that is postponed till next episode, because just as I was finishing the edit, we got a crashed audio file for the first time. But instead, what was scheduled for episode 40 has jumped the queue, so here goes. We welcome Annie, and Annie is in Southern Ireland, and Annie is actually going to talk to us about some encounters that happened way back in 1993, when she was living in mid-north Somerset. Annie, it's really good you can join us. Thanks for coming on the show. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me here, Rick. Pleasure. And very interesting that you're based in the Republic of Ireland because we have been on the lookout for at least one Irish episode. I mean, we want to cover Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland in time. Welcome as our first guest from Ireland, (laughs) even though we're talking about dear old Somerset. And we're going to hear about several encounters, Annie, that you had in the 93 to 94 time period. So I mean, we may as well start at the very beginning. Can you take us through the very first time that you experienced a cat? Yeah, well, not all of those encounters were my encounters. Three of the encounters that were around at the time within that area were the ones that I saw or were involved in. But the actual very first encounter was in the village, on the edge of the village that I lived in, just out of the blue, a a man was going to his shed early one morning to take out his bag of rubbish to put it outside the gate for the rubbish bin then to come along and pick it up. And it had been snowing, and as he leant against the door, he crouched down and, and put his shoulder against the door to actually open the lock at the bottom. As the door opened, a cat sprung out, from inside the shed over his shoulder because he was still crouched down. And it just made off across his garden and jumped over a a stone wall and headed off up into a small wood. So that was the very first time that a cat had been encountered in that area as such. And at the time, like I say, it had been snowing. So the cat had actually left prints in, in the snow, which the local press came around and photographed. And I think it actually made the news. And like you say, that was the actual winter of 93, end of 93 to 94, which actually was a very snowy winter. I think we had snow every month for maybe six months where we were living. So that was the very first time. Did you hear about that one direct from the neighbour or did you read about it in the local paper first? I think the information just kind of flew around the village first. There was a certain amount of disbelief at that time. You know, everybody, yeah, yeah, kind of business. And we just got on with our life. We didn't disbelieve him at all because the prints were there, very, very clear prints for everybody to see. I didn't really think anything more about it. And then my husband and I were actually out for a walk around the local quarry, which we live very close to. Um, It was a working quarry. They blasted every day at 1 p.m. So it was a very, very active quarry and we would take the dog up there for a walk so we were walking around 
one afternoon, I think it was, and in front of us across the lane, it wasn't a lane like traffic would go down. It was just like a maybe 10 or 15 foot cross lane that went around the edge of the quarry with brush on either side, a few small trees, and a cat just walked across in front of us. It was maybe 30, 40 foot away from us. And the dog at the time was off the lead. So we just quickly called the dog to us because we both knew what we had seen. Called the dog to us and miraculously the dog came. (laughs) So we, we put the dog on the lead and we actually walked on. My husband said, no, come on, we'll just keep walking. It's gone. So we carried on walking and we just walked straight across where this cat had actually crossed the lane in front of us. I guess we weren't scared at all. We just thought, well, it's passed on and and we walked on by. So that was the very first time that we'd actually seen this cat, which was a black cat. It was big. It was obviously feline. I saw it side on. I didn't get a front view at all. It wasn't lion type big. It was maybe the size of a, a large German shepherd, maybe, about maybe as tall. The tail was almost, I would say, as long as the body. And it was thick and it held the tail so that it wasn't up in the air. It was just kind of gracefully out behind it. I can't think of any other word to describe it. It looks like the tail was being carried maybe five or six inches off the floor, just in a gentle arc type thing, you know. And it just disappeared. It definitely seemed to know where it was going. It seemed to be on a mission. I don't know if it saw us. It just carried on on its way and we carried on on our way. We were shocked, but, you know, we still enjoyed our walk and and carried on. When that happened, did you assume, oh, that must link to what was in the papers about the cat that came from the shed? Yes, we did. Yeah. Straight away, we said it's that cat. It couldn't have been any other thing. You know, it was was definitely that cat. Um, I couldn't see any markings on it. It was just solid black far away as as we were we just automatically knew that that was what it was how long before the next one because there was another one hard on the heels of this wasn't there yeah there was another two hard on the heels of that one (laughs) always more or less always in the same spot within a couple of hundred yards of that same spot and both times I was on my own then with the dog And each time I saw it, I actually chose to turn around and walk back home. I didn't want to go by where it had just crossed. I don't know if that was because I felt I was on my own. I don't know if it would have made much difference, but I just didn't feel comfortable to do that at the time. So I I was quite annoyed because it was quite a long way back around the quarry to go home (laughs) rather than walking around in a big circle. You know, I had to turn around twice. Um, And each time the cat was going in the same direction and it wasn't always at the same time of day either. Yeah, it was just in a purposeful way. It just crossed the path like it had absolutely every rights to. It felt, it seemed to me that it was very, very comfortable in its surroundings. What about the dog, incidentally? The dog, yeah, the dog was more interested in sniffing the ground. The dog was a Welsh Springer Spaniel and he always just ran around with his nose to the floor. I don't think he was aware at all of the cat, really. He was just doing his own thing. And each time I saw it, I just called the dog back to me, put the dog on the lead and turned around and walked back. But the dog didn't show any awareness of the cat, no. The next encounter was a bit different because you didn't basically see the cat, but a neighbour was watching from a distance. And this is the one that's a little bit concerning, isn't it? Can you take us through it? Yeah, I was out for a walk again around this quarry with my husband. We just actually had a, a fairly uneventful walk, just the two of us. We started to walk back down towards the road, which was a fairly steep incline. And the little path there just kind of meandered around, almost like a zigzag down through the hill. And as we stood at the top there, looking across this very short, steep valley, we could see a neighbour of ours. She had come out of her house and was waving at us frantically. And we, we just thought she was just waving, just saying hi. So we just waved back and went, oh, you know, nice to see you or whatever. And we took no notice at all. We didn't seem 
concerned. There was no reason to be concerned at all. But the next thing we know, she came running up the track towards us, totally out of breath, and just saying, it's there, it's there, it's stalking you. I've been watching it. She had actually been watching this cat with her binoculars. And she said it had been sat there in the sun, having a wash. And then we came walking along and it crouched down into the grass, which obviously we couldn't see it because the grass was very tall. It was the area where the grass was never, ever cut. It was too steep. So she'd been watching this cat. We walked into the area that the cat was and she panicked because she thought that the cat was actually stalking us. Now we had the dog with us and actually just looking back and, and thinking about this, I actually don't think that that cat was stalking us. I think the cat was probably interested in the dog because the dog was a, a Welsh Springer Spaniel and he was very red all the way down his back, a really bright red like a fox. And he would have been meandering around through the grass there. We just couldn't see the cat at all. It just disappeared into the grass. And then when she came up to tell us, we looked around, we still couldn't see it. So whether it had actually gone by that point because she was coming up shouting to us, I'm not really sure. We just decided to quickly go. We put the dog on the lead and quickly just went back down the steep slope with her back down to the road. So no, that, that time I didn't see it at all. I wasn't even aware that it was there. It was the, the girl there that had actually seen it. And she was so convinced that she was really frightened. She was frightened for us. Although I, I don't know, were we in any danger at all? I'm not sure that we were. She, she definitely saw it there, you know. Gosh, what kind of distance away was she? She would have been several hundred yards away from us, far enough that we couldn't hear what she was saying when she was shouting to us. We could just see her waving. And it was a very steep, short valley. The road went up either side along the road from the quarry there. So we were on one side of the steep valley and she was on the other outside a bungalow there. Okay. Had she seen it before? No, she'd never seen it before. She'd heard the reports of it being around the village. And this actual area where we were was maybe three or four miles away from where it had been sighted. So she'd heard about it, but she hadn't even really thought much, you know. And then, like I say, that afternoon, she was just happened to catch sight of it there on this hill. Um, and she was, I think she said she was just admiring it. You think, oh, my, my word, it is that cat. Uh, And she didn't expect us to come walking into view. That was what panicked her, I think. And you were able to tell her that you could believe her because you'd seen it um, at close quarters in other situations. That's right, yeah. We actually then said to her that we'd both seen it together and I had then seen it twice after that on my own. Maybe in the back of her mind she was wondering, are they going to think that I'm I'm a bit crazy, you know? But um, definitely not, no. We, We knew that. But it was there. We just couldn't see it. It's just so stealthy. You know, there was no chance of us seeing it at all. Yeah. According to her, how close was it to you guys? She said it was no more than 15 to 20 foot away. And I'm still amazed that I didn't see it. The grass was thick, you know. And did it follow you? I think it was following the dog. I really don't think it was following us. Looking back on it, did the dog do anything to suggest it was stressed or worried? No, I really don't think the dog was aware of it either. Did the dog ever sense it, do you think, to your knowledge? No, but the dog was kind of strange. You know, I mean, he was a lovely dog, but he really was in a world of his own all the time. And like I say, he was a spaniel, although he had his nose to the floor all the time, but it was almost like he had blinkers on and, you know, he really wasn't paying attention to anything other than the immediate smell in front of his nose. I actually thought he would have been aware. He would have sensed it. He would have caught the smell of the cat if the cat gave off a smell. But no, there was there was nothing from him to, to alert us to the fact that there was something there. Nothing. Okay. Was that a turning point that made you a little bit more anxious uh, of the situation? Or did you just feel, well, there's a cat around. I know I've got to be careful Um, And this is just another example. It did, actually, Rick, yes. It it did make both of us more aware 
that it was there, that it wasn't afraid to be fairly close to us. And also the fact that we could actually walk into the area where that cat was. It did make us much more aware that it was there to be careful, to be aware, to not take things for granted, but at the same time to not be so afraid that we wouldn't go for a walk. Learning to live with it, but yeah, very carefully, yeah. Yeah, very carefully. Yeah, and what about um, vocalisations, calls and sounds? Did you ever experience any suspicious sounds that might have been from the cat, do you think? Yeah, we did. One night, very late at night, we'd actually gone to bed and our, our little cottage backed out onto fields. And suddenly there was a huge noise outside. And my husband said, it's that cat, because the cat, the noise that we heard was making a sound like a saw, like a man sawing a piece of wood. And it was making a lot of noise around. The children's toys were out back. So it was knocking these things over and everything. And I had hens at the time. So we just thought it was the cat. We were fairly frightened because it was pitch black. There was no outside light. We didn't have a torch with us. And my husband's only really now just said to me that he was frightened because the bedroom window was fairly close to the ground. So he said, oh, I need to get rid of it. So he opened the window and he started throwing things like shoes and boots out at this cat. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I really don't know what he was hoping to achieve. (laughs) But, um, you know, he was just trying to shoo it away and, and get rid of it. And so, yeah, he started throwing items out the window. (laughs) <laughs> and all I can just remember thinking was, no, not my shoes, not my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it did eventually go, and he said, oh, it's gone. I saw it jump up over the wall and into the next garden over, and then made its way on up into the field. So he could see the shadow of it. So he knew that it had gone at that time. But that was the only time that I'd ever heard any kind of vocalization from it, or was actually fairly close to it but within the wall of a house between me and a, and a window between me and it reflecting on that that's most likely leopard like noises isn't it? leopard soaring is a is what they right. do it, it is it has got a soaring sound that deep guttural rhythmic sound um so you'd never heard that but you just made the assumption it was a, a cat yeah we did first of all i thought maybe it was a fox or a badger or you know because we would get everything there but it certainly didn't sound, you know, I know the sound of a fox and, you know, the snuffling noises and everything of a badger. And it definitely wasn't that. And also the actual, the outline, if you like, or the the shadow of the cat that he could see was a lot, lot bigger than that. It wasn't a small animal. What do you think it was doing there? I wonder had it come into the garden because it got the smell of the chickens. But they were all shut up nicely for the night. There could have even been, you know, the kids right at the back playing. They could have dropped bits of sandwich or anything. It could have been there after that. There was no rubbish bins there. Um, I don't know, really. I would imagine that it got the scent of the hens and came in to investigate and then thought it would just have a little meander around through the toys. <laughs> it's a communication sound, you know, that is intriguing as to why it was doing that, communicating. Is it? Right. Right. I didn't know that. Yeah, okay. And of course, you're going to be ticked off, Anne, I'm afraid, Annie, because um, that was your chance to film it. Well, there you go. But, you know, it was back in 1993. I hardly even had a camera, let alone something to film anything with. (laughs) Yeah, and it was late at night. (laughs) Well, it was dark, yeah. And like I say, there was no outside light and we didn't have a torch even. So there was no way of seeing exactly what it was. And it was hardly a priority at the time when you were so freaked out. No, I was more more priorities trying to make sure that all my wardrobe didn't end out on, on the floor outside. <laughs> I have been in trouble in our house for throwing things out the bedroom window. The squirrels hogging the bird feeder when I know the woodpeckers want to get on there. <laughs> it <laughs> drives me mad. Uh, sometimes if I can't get the dog out to help me politely shoo them off, I yeah. will just <laughs> lose patience and hurtle something out of the bedroom window. <laughs> <laughs> are you a good aim though rick that's the thing rarely but uh, <laughs> the squirrels don't mind they'll just have something whistling around two centimeters from their ears and carry on regardless yeah they're bold 
Oh dear, right. Yes, how intriguing. So that was the only that was the closest you were aware that it got to mm. the house. Yes, definitely. Yes. The only other time, like I say, that it got close to anybody's house was the very first instance that it was seen when it was in the, the man's shed and it literally jumped out over poor guy, you know. Yeah. So you knew then it was coming into the garden sometimes and potentially stalking you or your dog. So again, it's sort of heightening the stakes of it all, isn't it? It really is um, suggesting there's one right outside your house sometimes. Yeah, but that was the only incidents, yeah. incident rather, that I had known that it was right there. And I think it was just taking a chance coming in that close. You know, maybe it was hungry, looking for a chicken dinner. Sure. OK. Now, the times you saw it, you think it was always the same one, did you? Did you ever feel there could have been more than one? No, I always thought it was the same one, I guess, because I never, ever considered that there would be more than one. Mm. There was only ever one scene at a time. So I just, yeah, no, I just presumed that there was just one cat. And I, I do feel that there was just one cat. But I did always see it more or less in the same spot. Like, you know, the three times that I've seen it, which was once with my husband and twice on my own, mm. it was within the very small area there. Did you get the feeling it knew you? you? We sometimes get this from witnesses. They feel that they've almost got a relationship with the cat, that if they've seen it, you know, a few times, that it sort of knows the vibes of the person that it's detouring around or watching or whatever. Did you ever feel there was any kind of relationship with it? No, I didn't. No, I think it was just on its route A to B. It never once looked my way. It just crossed the path in front of me. No, I, I don't feel that it was... It may have been aware of me there. I'm really not sure, but I didn't feel any kind of connection to it. You were just one other pesky dog walker for it to evade. Yeah. And not many people walked their dogs up around that quarry either. It was just me and maybe one other person would go up there with their dog. It wasn't a, a regular walking area. Did you discuss it with that other person? Did they ever admit to anything? No. No, I didn't. No. No, OK. A quick interval now, and thank you to Annie for suggesting our word of the week. And it is literally a gem of a word, because it is chatoyancy, or chatoyance. It will be familiar to anyone with an interest in gemstones because it's all about the cat's eye effect from the band of light refraction in a polished curved gemstone. From Encyclopedia Britannica on the web, the definition of chatoyance is the property of some minerals to exhibit a wavy luminous band with a silky luster reminiscent of the eye of a cat. It's coined from the French for eye of the cat and of course we're talking about the vertical slit-shaped pupil in a felis type of cat. The link we put on the website has lots of examples of gemstones and the shimmering and floating effects of the cat's eyes. And you can also see chatoyancy in Finnish woods because a similar effect can occur after wood turning and wood finishing in certain grains of woods. So much more on this on the website under episode 39. And thanks again, Annie, for chatoyance or chatoyancy as word of the week. Did you ever speak to any of the quarry operators about whether they saw anything? Because presumably if it was hanging around in the quarry a fair bit, some of them might have done, or do you think they kept it quiet anyway, perhaps if they did ever come across it? I would tend to think that they would keep it quiet. I didn't speak to any of them. Um, I didn't actually really know any of the actual workers in there. I did know one or two of the drivers, but they were just coming in and out and taking loads in and out of the quarry. So I didn't get to speak to any of them at all. What about its reasons for being there? Do you think it had a den site? Do you think there were lots of deer there? What was the main reason, do you think, it was there so often? There were lots of deer there. Often of a morning, I would see deer run across through the back of the house. In the field behind the house, there were often two or three deer just up there running around. 
Also, there were reports that deer had been found killed. Mm -hmm. And a, the actual neighbouring farmer had lost a couple of sheep and a lamb. I would say that it was managing to live quite happily. There was a, an awful lot of prey for it to take if it wanted to. And it seemed to be quite happy with the noise that was going on. It was, um, it was a fairly busy environment for a cat to be in. Plenty of prey, plenty of local food, and it may or may not have had a den site and lay-up spots. Presumably it was laying up in the quarry environment somewhere at some time. It must have been, because it, I saw it so often. Like I said, it was during the winter of 93 and into the spring of 94. We actually moved over to Southern Ireland in the autumn of 94. So I was aware of it for about a year. Did you become intimidated during that time? Did you think, oh, I, you know, I'd love to go for a nice, relaxing, tranquil walk in my local woodland quarry environment, but I'm a bit bothered that I might encounter the Black Panther again? Did it get to you? It did. Yeah. If I'm honest, yes, it did. It certainly altered the way I viewed things. I would be very much more aware of my environment. Part of the way that I walked often with the dog, the sides were very steep up either side of me. And I would also be very wary that it could actually be up above me somewhere and I wouldn't see it. Yeah, it did. It altered the way that I viewed things because part of me was actually frightened what could happen. It does make you more aware of the countryside. I felt it was an honour to see it. I felt very much delighted that I'd seen it, but at the same time, I had a healthy respect for it. And I didn't want to disturb it if it had prey. I didn't want people hurting it either. That was the other thing. So I didn't say too much to anybody at all because I didn't want to draw attention onto the fact that it seemed to be up there. And I didn't want every Tom, Dick and Harry up there with a gun. Is that why you didn't speak to many local people about it as well? Yeah, that and the point of being ridiculed. The man who had it in his shed, there was a certain amount of ridicule thrown his way. They, oh, you're making it up, you know. And yet there were clear footprints and he definitely didn't make that up. I didn't want to be ridiculed at all. Yeah. <laughs> and I've not actually spoken about it to anybody really until now. Did you change your walking habit, the locations you went to, or did you stick to that area and thought, I am a bit sort of on edge, but I'm still going to tough it out and go this way? I just kept to the way that I would normally walk. I didn't suddenly start thinking, I'm going to drive off somewhere and get out and walk there. No, I just always kept to the same route, really. That was the way I liked to walk, and, and that was the way I, I just continued on to walk. What about pets going missing? Did you hear of any dogs or cats ever going missing in suspicious circumstances? No, I didn't hear at all of anything like that going missing. I just heard that there had been deer killed. There didn't seem to be a spate of any animals going missing. So it wasn't like it was really misbehaving and putting extreme pressure on the neighbourhood? It was just something that you had to be wary of on your walks and be on, on edge about? Yeah, really, yeah. It didn't seem to be predating on people's pets at all. It wasn't troublesome. And I think maybe that's why everybody just was aware in the village that it, it was there. Nobody really spoke too much about it, but we all knew that it was there. And I don't know what happened to it after that, to be honest with you, Rick, because we moved away. So it could very well have still been there a couple of years later, or maybe it moved on. At the time, I can remember thinking, why did it suddenly turn up? Was it wandering around and then it found a food source and it stopped? I don't really know how they live their lives as such, you know. Well, they normally have a reasonable sized territory. It wouldn't be resident in one woodland or one quarry all the time. It might be a couple of weeks here and there, but it would normally fluctuate across its territory, which um, could be you know, as small as five square miles in their native countries and as big as 50 square miles. It really does depend on circumstances and prey and the extent to which they're bothered and the extent right. to which they feel hemmed in by their neighbours. Maybe that it had been around, um, and they're so stealthy, of course, it maybe it had been around before and you'd not seen it and noticed it, you know, the few times it was in that quarry. You never know these things, that's the problem. That's true, yeah. Reflecting on it now, what are your thoughts? 
presumably you've realised it wasn't a one-off. You know, these things are similar uh, events, similar experiences are, are happening to people, you know, across Britain. What kind of emotions do you have looking back on that particular episode of your life? Both my husband and I feel quite honoured that we saw it. Yeah, it's just a good feeling to have seen it because I know that they are so elusive, even though I realise now that there are a good few of them out there. At the time, back then, I didn't think that there was that many of them. I'd heard of the Beast of Exmoor and the Beast of Bodmin or whatever, and I can remember just thinking, I don't like it called that because it just makes it out to be something to be frightened of. A beast, a beast is something that conjures up fear to me. And I just thought, no, I, I think that they're quite happily out there if they're there. And we just feel honoured to have seen it. Um, yeah, nice. I'm glad that we saw it anyway. And I wouldn't be frightened if I saw another one here, although I do feel I'm unlikely to see one here. Yeah. Although you say they are here. <laughs> yeah, well, there's certainly credible reports. I think um, you know, we look forward to meeting people who are on the case in Ireland or, or some witnesses. Just to try and play devil's advocate, what if you knew that it had taken your dog or you saw it taking your dog? Would, you, would that have changed your attitude to it? Yes. I guess in some ways I would be upset, obviously. Yeah, I would have been upset if I'd realised that it had been taking pets or my pet in particular. But at the same time, in some ways, I guess you could say, well, it, you would have to say, well, it's just one of those things. It's nature and nature is cruel. But I would still be upset, yeah, uh, if it had taken the dog. If that day when it had been stalking the dog, it had actually got the dog and jumped on it, I think probably I would never forget it, for one thing, because it would have been a horrific thing to encounter. But, yeah, it, nature can be cruel, and, and that's the way it is. And it's an apex predator. And so, obviously, it's going to take other animals and... Yeah, it's sad if it is your animal that it takes. It's sad for the farmer if it's his use that it's taking as well because, mm. you know, it's an awful lot of money to lose. It may affect the way that I would feel, but I wouldn't want that animal killed either. Yeah. What about even recovered into, into a wildlife park, you know, trapped humanely and, and recovered, as difficult as that is? Yeah, I think I would have mixed feelings on that, really. It depends where the animal came from to be honest. If the animal had been released and it had been used to being in captivity and it was taken back into captivity, then maybe you could more accept it. But if it had actually been born in the wild, then it would be cruel then, I think. I feel to put it into captivity because it had eaten somebody's dog. Yes, it would crush its spirit. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it would. It would affect the cat. Terribly, I think. There is a place for them. There is definitely a place for them. I mean, here, and I'm sure in the UK now, the deer are so many that they are undergoing a cull. And people are up in arms because the deer are having to be culled so many per year. Whereas if there was an apex predator, that wouldn't happen so much because everything would be in its place. And, you know, everything would be more of a balance. So you see it having a role in our ecosystem? Most definitely, yeah. What about the fact that it's not officially a native animal, like, say, the lynx? We've been talking about the lynx in, the, in previous episodes recently. Do you just see it as a similar type of predatory cat to the lynx, or do you, do you feel the lynx has got stronger rights? <laughs> I think that people, not just me, but I, I think that people would be more willing to accept a lynx being there. Mm. Uh, whether they view it because it would be a smaller animal, I'm not sure. But a lynx can do an awful lot of damage if it wants to as well. So I wouldn't mind if they were all there, to be honest. <laughs> you know, uh, the people are talking about reintroducing pine martin. Well, we had pine martin here. It took out a friend of mine's chickens the other night. You know, So they're here. So we have to deal with things maybe others don't anyway. But I, I do feel that, yeah, there is definitely a place for lynx and for leopard, even though the leopard are not here originally. I know I know what you're saying there, yeah. OK, yeah. Incidentally, do you ever see a pine martin? I gather they are very stealthy as well. They are. No, I don't. 
not here, but I'm very close to the sea. The sea is across the road from me, but I've got mountains behind me and woodland. So it's a good environment, but mostly I would see otter and weasel. But I've never actually seen a pine martin here, no. But there are pine martins territories around you? Most definitely. I need to set up a trial cam and put some jam sandwiches out. (laughs) Yeah, sure. How often do you see an otter, incidentally? Not that often, no. They have been in in the sea towards the end of the road there. I've seen them in a previous house we lived in. You would just see them catch fish and eat them and... Yeah, it's lovely to see. I do enjoy seeing them as well. Uh, sadly, you sometimes see them dead on the road here. If they're keeping to the same route, you know, eventually they will get run over. We have lots of them here. Sea otters, yeah. And again, they're elusive. Not everybody would see them. Yeah. Thank you all very much for this. What is so interesting for the podcast is that we're going back to 1993. Most listeners would know, well, yeah, there's been sightings of these cats for years and decades. And it's very interesting to go back to some of the ones many years ago and see how vivid and real they are and what kind of impact they had on the witness. Mm. How intriguing is it for you to still read about the subject decades later? And it's much the same. And also, it's much the same that people have the same kind of attitude of keeping it below the radar, not talking about it much. All of those kinds of vibes live on, don't they? The way that we treat the subject is, seems to be very similar to how it was back in 1993-94. Yeah, that's very true, actually. Yeah, And I think as well, once you've actually seen one, you never forget it. I haven't spoken about it really for the past 20 years. so, But it's always been there in my mind. And yeah, I would have an interest now in, in knowing that they are still there and that they're thriving. Which is good. Yeah, I enjoy that thought that they are still there and thriving well, it seems. So, yeah, no, it stays with you if you see any large cat like that, anything out of the usual that you're not expecting to see. And it's a lovely experience to see them. And you do feel honoured to have seen them. Now there is um, a recently formed Somerset Facebook group to um, discuss it and take sightings. So hopefully they'll find this interesting. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, because I'm sure that there are still sightings going on around that area. I don't see them reported very often, but um, I'm sure at one time it was a hot spot. So surely they must still be there. But like you say, it could be the fact that people are just keeping sightings close to their chest because they don't want lots of people turning up on their doorstep either. Yeah, well, certainly different parts of Somerset now are semi-regularly getting reports of all the three main candidate cats. And this area you're talking about, I know you don't want to give it away, even though it's so many years on. From my knowledge, a few months ago, earlier in 2020, this area, about five miles away, was in the press for a couple of sightings. I think one witness came forward and then about two weeks later in the same local newspaper, somebody else, I think another a driver, saw one close by. But that wasn't right by your quarry. It was probably five to eight miles away. That is interesting, though, that they are still being sighted. Yeah, maybe relatives of yours. (laughs) Maybe. (laughs) Great-grandchildren. Yeah, sure. Anything else you'd like to say before we leave it? I would be very, very interested to, to know about them over here in Ireland. I do know that there was one um, sighted fairly close to Cork City in the countryside there and I think there's been several sighted further north so they're obviously here there's also a man who is actually rewilding up in County Donegal he's rewilding within a enclosure within a a woodland and lake enclosure and he's bringing in animals that would have been here generations ago you know so he has the Eurasian lynx there So he's really just going for animals that would have had a connection to Ireland and would have been here thriving in the past. They're rewilding, but they aren't, if you know what I mean. Be more like under a zoo licence situation, I suspect, there's a big fence. And is that with getting people in, the public in, to pay an experience? Yeah, and it's going well for him because he opened up just before lockdown, sadly, the first lockdown. Mm -hmm. So he's struggled. But, you know, lots of people are supporting him and realise what he's trying to do is very good for the environment as well. And 
people like to see animals that were here many years ago, you know. Yes. And we know how they affect the ecosystem. That's the benefit, isn't it? Many animals that are introduced and were never here before can have no or little negative effect whatsoever, but you don't know that necessarily until they're here. But we can predict largely what former native animals are going to do to the ecosystem. And how are you hearing about the reports you just mentioned through the media, through press reports and websites? Yeah, the media, the newspaper. You would hear, you know, that something has been cited. I don't think that there's going to be the same numbers that you have in the UK for, you know, we are a smaller place, smaller population as well, a smaller area. But then this is very rural. There could easily be animals here and you just would not see them because everything is so wild anyway. And I think there are two key questions in, in a place like Ireland and Northern Ireland. Beyond the cats that are seen, that are credible reports, is there any breeding? And then is there any breeding that is viable in the short, medium term? Those questions, I think, are more apparent in a place like Ireland. You know, Is it just a few vagrant cats that have been let out and released and eventually they'll die out? Or is there some breeding and it will be a prolonged situation? Yeah, I guess it, it depends as well whether they've let out a family group or, you know, just the odd cat. OK, Annie, and very timely that we're talking about um, island sightings because you're based in Ireland now. And within the last two weeks of um, doing this interview, there's been a new Ireland Facebook group for big cat sightings in Ireland set up. And you were one of the initial members of that. So you're starting to get an early impression of types of sightings and geographical spread of sightings in Ireland now, are you? Yes, it's a really good group that has been set up now on Facebook. Um, there's been a fair few people there actually mentioning areas and cats that they've seen. And I'm actually surprised how many sightings there have been here in Southern Ireland. It's really nice to know that they are there, even though I've never seen one. But um, And the group is very, very helpful. It's a really helpful, friendly group to have there. So it's much needed as well. Great. That is good news. What kind of historical trend is there? The some recent and some several years ago? Was it too early to say at the moment? Yeah, some of them are several years ago. There's a fairly well documented event where there were six sightings, I think, of a puma within nine days in County Court. They were so credible that the, um, the Irish equivalent of the RSPCA put out cameras and traps, actually. They said that there were cases of horses being spooked. There was also fewer foxes around afterward. Mm -hmm. So they, they were fairly convinced that there was an animal there. And they also got in touch with the wildlife park here in Cork to see whether they had lost anything. Now, they don't actually keep pumas at all. So, so no, they hadn't lost anything. Yeah, that was a couple of years ago, if I remember that case, because that was in the press, wasn't it? That's right. It was in the press. It was 2018, I think. So, But there were a couple of more incidences further north and in County Waterford further east. Sometimes it's been of a black cat, sometimes puma type. There are a few out there, far more out there than I ever actually thought that there would be. The ones that I know of go back around 2017 and earlier. A recent move now is that since September this year, there's actually now being considered to reintroduce the lynx here into Ireland for full reintroduction, which is, is great. They hope actually that it will fill a vacuum that was left by it when it died out, you know, and help to balance the woodland and the ecosystems and keep everything under control. So, And there's so much space here. Even if there was lynx introduced here, I really doubt that you'd ever see one. Yeah, but that's par for the course, even yeah, wherever they are. This Facebook group is excellent. So I would say to anybody, if you're on Facebook, and there are members there from the UK as well and Scotland, it's not just mm -hmm. solely Ireland. You know, anybody is welcome, I think. Yeah, very good. That's very good to hear. And obviously, we hope to hear from some of those witnesses in future podcast episodes here. And we're, mm. you know, on the case and... Um, Hope to hear from them soon. And what about Northern Ireland? Does the Facebook group cover both sides, the Republic and Northern Ireland? Yes, it does. 
it covers everything there, yeah. which is great because there's a fairly big catchment area between the north and the south. And, you know, cats, they just walk across the border anyway. So yeah, <laughs> it's good to have people from, you know, there's been sightings up around Newry and as well as down here. So there are many sightings. But it would be nice if a few people wanted to share their experience of their sightings with you. So that would be interesting to Irish people here as well to, to bring it to the forefront for them. Yeah, that'd be lovely. Well, we'll do our best and we'll hope to engage with some Irish um, guests quite soon. So thank you for that, yeah. Annie. And, and great that you're... Um, have you told them about your uh, experience? They know that you're a member because you've had sightings back in Britain. They do. No, I don't actually think I've actually shared my experience there with them at all. Mostly because I know that this podcast is coming out. So. Yeah, you can link it to them, hopefully. They can hear about my experience on here. Good stuff. Yeah. Well, Annie, great that you're making that link with the Facebook group and good luck to the Ireland Facebook group and all its members and great to hear it's off to a good start. So, Annie, thank you very much for coming on the show. I'm sure everyone appreciates all that you've had to say. It's so interesting to hear about one a long time ago, but so as if it was yesterday. You know, obviously it's very vivid memories for you and that sort of thing still happening today. Yes, it certainly it stayed fresh in my mind completely all all over these years you know so i've really enjoyed talking to you rick great well thank you very much all the best annie okay before we close a couple of announcements first look out for the tet zoo con webinar conference event on 12th of december i'll be helping with the big cats part of that at 8 p.m and there will be plenty of fascinating things elsewhere on the day's agenda for that all brought to you from the maestro himself, Darren Naish, and his close colleagues. We'll add a link on the Big Cat Conversations website for that event. So that's 12th of December, Big Cats at 8pm in the Tech Zoo Con webinar. Our episode 40 will be out just before Christmas, and we will be uncomfortably close with the Peak District Panther for that one. Meantime, thanks again to Annie, our guest, and thanks everyone for your support for the show. Until next time, look after yourselves and bye for now.